Oh, Father, just as many of us are parents who love our children and often purchase those kids gifts to give them joy, even though we are adults, we are most gratified as we watch our kids receive those gifts that we give to them. And the most rewarding gift to us is to see the expression of excitement and gratitude on their faces as they receive our gifts. Lord, the goal of our study tonight is to look deeply into your gift, your word. This is your gift to us. Hopefully, we will do this as if you were actively watching us to see how we would respond and do we hang on to every word of this gift that you have given us as if it were the most important thing and if as if it could be life-changing because you are watching and because your word is the most important thing we look into your word at this depth because we we've realized that the most precious moments in our lives is when there is an intersect where we meet precious truth unexpectedly face to face all believers have these moments with you and with your word. And we hope tonight will be one of those moments. We sit up and we take careful notice because like a gift that is prepared with particular care and particular love, even the wrapping paper and the box that it comes in has been carefully picked out and it's been purchased and lovingly designed to express the deepest of love in the gift. And the preparation of that gift is almost as important as the gift itself. Tonight, we have this opportunity to look up at you with new appreciation for the tender care with which you have prepared for us a highway to heaven and an eternal dwelling in safety and fullness of joy and not to forget that there with you, the Bible says, are yet unrevealed pleasures that is going to last forevermore. Lord, give us this gift again tonight and let us gaze at your treasury tonight and not forget that you are gazing back at us to see what will be our reaction to these things. What will be our reaction to the paper that was picked out, to the gift box that was picked out? What is our reaction to the wonderful and carefully given gifts of God? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. So good to see all of you. We are in a crazy world that's getting crazier by the day. I feel sorry for the churches who uh, never get into prophecy because they are, they are literally on a Titanic that's sinking and they don't even know why because they're expecting God to come in another thousand years. Last week, we started our introduction to the book of John. Tonight, we're picking up right where we left off. And the book of John is so precious. It's so important. It is so meaningful. And I hope that as long as we're in John, that once a week, you'll find the time to read the chapter that we're in so that you're you're kind of being able to anticipate some things that are coming as we talk about this. Our journey into this most important of the Gospels is crucial to our faith because it answers many questions that you may not have even thought of. And you know, that's a real important thing, uh, especially those of you that want to become more evangelistic and want to help reach your neighbors or reach your friends. You want to talk to people about the word of God. You need to think of not just your questions, but you need to think of the questions, right? So that you will know, because they're coming, the questions are coming and we want to know these things. And especially if we have kids, if we have children, our children and their children are not going to become Christian because they're our children. They're going to become Christian only if you teach these things to your children. And you have to teach them in a way that they will be able to grasp it and in a way that will make it interesting to them and make them want to learn these things. And so we really, really need to know 
these kind of things so that we can become teachers to our families of all of these things in detail. Because faith cannot be ordered and cannot be understood unless discipleship happens. And discipleship has to be the result of following the Lord through his scripture, through his word. And that's how we get this to the next generation and the next generation and so forth. Probably everybody here tonight is here because somebody before us knew God and knew scripture. And therefore, that's why we're here. I know that's why I'm here. I know that's why Susie's here. I know why my kids are here. I know why Ronnie's kids are here because that goes beyond Ronnie to how he was also raised around the Christian faith. And so isn't that amazing? It's It works wonderfully in this way. It was, it was also true of Kristen, who had people in her family that were, uh, I think, grandmother that was a really good Christian. So these, these are, these cannot be overstated, but I'm going to tell you something. We will lose it if we don't have enough interest in it to find out the details and to go deep into the word of God. And it is amazing how many people are religious, but the Bible is secondary to them. Going to church is the big thing for them. Going and feeling God is the big thing for them. But reading the word of God, now nah, they don't worry about that. They let the pastor do the reading of the word of God. That's not good enough. You, you're born again, not by the pastor's understanding of the word of God. You're born again by the word of God by having a direct contact with it. You can't get somebody pregnant without direct contact. You can't have kids without direct contact. And you can't be a child of God without direct contact. So we are going to resume on what was last week, the introduction or the beginning of the introduction to the gospel of John. And so tonight we continue there making the key points uh, of this introduction. So John, the, the, uh, he's called the evangelist by many scholars. And so John carefully gives the gospel to us in chronological orders. It's really important to understand this because not all the gospels come to us in chronological order like John's does. This is why you will see the phrase in John the next day, quote unquote, and you'll see it often in the gospel of John. It is carefully written in order that the things that took place took place. And so John also is known for making the big point of the deity of Christ. He calls attention to the deity of Christ, and he is very carefully looking at making sure you understand there's this John the Baptist prophet is the greatest prophet that ever lived up until this time. And then there's Jesus, and he's in a whole different uh, category. And so uh, John is making a very clear statement when he goes through this, and he wants to make sure you understand the divinity of Christ, that he's not simply a prophet. Christ is God Almighty. And this is so important to us. For all of my life, I've studied the Bible since I was 10 years old. That means that I have over 50 years of actually seriously looking at the Word of God. I got a kick out of thinking about this on the, uh, on the bike the other day when I was taking a ride. I thought, you know, my dad died at 59 years old, and I started calculating how long did my dad live for God, and it came out to about 38 years. Uh, a lot of times, you think of your dad, and you think, wow, you know, you, you never get to that level, but actually, I have lived and studied the Bible for 20 years longer than my dad did. And I think, wow, that's crazy. If I mean, if I sat down with my dad right now and, and it stopped where he died and, and I'm where I am still, we could have some interesting conversations because I've had a whole third of a life to learn things that he didn't even have the time to learn. And so this is such, such a privilege uh, for me. And very soon I'm going to go through a night where we're going to cover uh, the distinctives of what is important in a church and in a pastor and in our Christian belief system. And I want to give you some big issues that are happening today that literally is a divide between the true church and the fake church. And it, it, is, it is so amazing, and I guarantee you, 
that most of these issues are probably not even highlighted in your mind as being even in the world. But yet, uh, because I've been able to do a lot of reading throughout my life of being a minister, I have been able to see and look back at history and start finding my way into letting the Holy Spirit guide me away from the divide, because there is this huge divide coming over the church, and it's not going to be us dividing from them. And by the church, I mean the whole Christian church uh, globally, uh, especially maybe in the United States. There is going to be some real pressure put on us to uh, join with the majority church, which, by the way, under the current of that is trying to get back to the Roman Catholic Church. That is what's going on in the, in, in the church world today. The, there's this underhanded move to try to bring the church back under the Roman Catholic false Christian church. And this is a huge mistake. And this started way back in the 60s. And so someday I'll tell you more about that, but not tonight. But what I'm saying this for is to show you why details like this make so much sense. Uh, sense and which also means these are the things you need to know. I hope, you know, my greatest fear is that you'll leave tonight thinking we didn't teach anything about practical living tonight. We're going to be teaching about theology and about who Jesus is. And you might leave and say, what did I really get out of that? I hope that's not the case. I hope what you get out of this is understanding so that you can have your defenses up against false religion, false doctrine, false teaching, doctrines of devils. And one of those is to attack Jesus's deity. The Jehovah's Witnesses do this. The Mormons do this. Uh, very dangerous as I see people palling up with people like Glenn Beck. Uh, I see pastors palling up with Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck is a Mormon. He's not one of us. As a conservative, he is one of us, but as a Mormon, he's not one of us. And you have to keep that separate. I love him politically. I like to hear him politically. I listened to him today about Trump's indictment. I liked what he said, and I will listen to him politically. But I don't like to see pastors glomming on to Glenn Beck without differentiating this difference because there is a difference that matters. If you do not believe Jesus is the God Almighty, you don't have the doctrine that can save you. That's the truth. And you don't need people just friendly to Jesus. You need people to understand who Jesus is. I'm hoping that as we go through John, that all of us will very much know who Jesus is according to what Jesus' testimony is in his own book. So the key verse in John is from John 16, verse 28. And here's Mike to read it to us. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. Wow. So that's saying it pretty clearly. I came forth from the Father. Um, you, you, you can't say that. I can't say that. I, I, I can't even say I came forth from God in any sense in, in my human existence. But Jesus is saying to them, here's where I came from and here's where I will end up. And he is making it very clear. And John is telling us from Jesus's own mouth, the truth about his uniqueness. This is not something that we can do. This is only something God can do. John the Baptist couldn't come to, the, to Israel as a prophet and say, I came forth from the father. No, they knew where he came forth from. He had a father and a mother. Jesus had no human father. This is a supernatural act that happened in Jesus's world. He had a stepdad, but he had no human father. The only people that knew that was Joseph and Mary. <laughs> They're the only ones that could possibly know this. And this was the testimony. And Joseph, Jesus's stepdad, did not believe it until an angel, Gabriel, came to him and said, go ahead, marry her. What has happened with her is supernatural. And she is going to have a son, and you're going to call him Jesus. So this was how it came about. But this is one of those things, like we talked about last week, 
2,000 years later, we may just say, okay, okay, that's, that's what it is. Okay, that's it. No, I want you to understand this is a bizarro story. This is a story that you cannot with a straight face say is true unless you have faith in the God who can do things that are supernatural and who can do things beyond nature. If you don't believe in the God who can do things beyond nature, you cannot believe in a virgin birth. You cannot believe Jesus came from the Father and then appeared in the world in human flesh. It's not possible. While Christ's deity is at the forefront of John's gospel, that, that's the main thing he's pushing for us to understand. He also is uniquely one who stresses his humanity. For instance, this story about Jesus being on his on a road to Samaria, and he meets up with a Samaritan woman at a well, and he's tired. He's human. He's tired. He asks her, can you give me a drink? And so it, John shows us that side of him. And then Jesus is said in John eleven thirty five 35, when he finds out that Lazarus has died and it said, it's the shortest verse in the whole Bible. You can, you can know that when you leave here tonight, you can at least quote one verse, Jesus wept, <laughs> John eleven thirty five. 35. And the funny thing is, is that Everybody assumes that Jesus wept there because he was sad. That is hilarious that people come to that conclusion. Someone just tells you somebody died and you go, oh, don't worry about it. I'm going to raise him from the dead. You don't weep because he died. You're going to bring him back to life. You're going to rejoice that you get to do the work of God and do a miracle. He wept because of their total lack of faith in him. He turned water into wine. He healed sick people. He made lepers well. He raised others from the dead. And he tells them, don't worry, he's going to live again. And they didn't believe him. That's why he wept. He was frustrated. What do I have to do to make these people believe in me? And if we're not if we were to be honest with ourselves, we do the same thing to him. We have years in our life, if we've lived for God long, where God did this and you're telling people what God does. And then the next time you think he lets you down, you forget all the things he did for you. And that's what Jesus had to deal with. He had to deal with people who thought, oh, but he can't do that. He can turn water into wine. He can, you know, heal that leper. He even can uh, make a blind man see. But Lazarus is dead for four for three days. He can't be brought back to life or four days. I think it was. So it's very important to understand Jesus had a human side and that's what made this so hard to see when you're with someone who get, takes naps on boats, uh, snores, um, has to use the bathroom. It's going to be hard to say, but he's the son of God. How do you translate that? It's hard enough doing it now, distance from it. It must have been that much harder in person because, first of all, Jesus wasn't good looking. He didn't look like a god. He didn't have probably a, you know, uh, a great physique. He probably looked very average. The Bible says, we know this, because it says that he would have no appearance that would make someone desire him physically. And so this is interesting because what is this? This is God clouding the picture as God is very good to do. He clouded the picture. He makes sure that only certain people are going to recognize him. Others, he can't allow them to recognize him. Even if he's doing miracles, he looks so diminutive. That means small. He looks so small that he can't possibly be what it appears that he is. This is so important to see because this is how God is in our world today. Don't you wish you could just be like Elijah when you're trying to get someone to believe in God and say, here, I'll just bring fire out of heaven. And I'll show you God's real. When I tell him, put fire out of heaven, then he will. And then you'll believe that's what we think, but that doesn't work. And that's not what works. And that's not how God wants people to come to faith. The way that God wants people to come to faith is by the testimony of Scripture. That is the way that he has ordained people to come to faith. In John, contrary to the other gospel writers, he rarely uses the term Christ on the uh, end of Jesus' name. I said last week, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. Uh, but why did John avoid uh, or not make a big deal out of Jesus' 
the Christ or Jesus Christ. And the, the answer to this is because John was emphasizing that it was God who became man. God becoming man on that spectrum doesn't need an anointing word like Christ. God came down to us. And so the other gospels emphasize that side of Christ. But for John, he was very uh, determined to make us understand the, the depth of who Jesus was as God in the flesh. So using Christ or the Christ means Messiah emphasizes the man side, the human side, who is God's anointed. And in the Bible, being the Christ or being a Christ, let's say it that way, is not a new thing and it's not limited to the God man, see? And so you could be David and be a sort of Christ because he was anointed by God to be the king of Israel. He was anointed by God to be a prophet. He was anointed by God in many ways, but he wasn't the Christ. He wasn't the final anointed one. So this is why John doesn't uh, emphasize this part of it, of course. So God or Jesus was both. He was both God and Christ. He was in the flesh, but he was from heaven. The other gospels emphasize that it is the Christ because they're especially Matthew is appealing to the Jews and saying the Christ that you know is coming. By the way, the Jews still know that Christ is supposed to still come. They just don't see it in the same way that we do, but they do know there's supposed to be a Messiah coming. The point of John's gospel is confirming Christ's deity. This is the major uh, point that he wants to make. And when you realize that even the Jews who do believe that a Messiah is coming, they don't think he's going to be a uh, God man. They think he's just going to be a human who is political, who God is with. So God has anointed him like David was anointed by God. That's how they see it. They do not accept the Christian version of Christ as the anointed. So this is why confirming the deity or the divinity of Christ or of Jesus is the point of the book of John. Another verse I want to take you to that makes a key point here is John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also did in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So there it is. Here we go. We look in the book of John and we see it and we say, okay, why is this here? John, if we could bring him from heaven and have him stand here tonight. He would make it very simple. That's there so you can go where I just came from. That's there so you can get eternal life. And it's interesting how he says, you know, Jesus did these many other signs. This is kind of a tip hat to the other books that talked about things that John didn't talk about. He was very careful to show that there is only one reason for these things. And this too, by the way, is why you don't in your theology read uh, the book of Acts and read uh, the, uh, the gospels and watch all the exciting miracles that they did and decide you're going to be that evangelist that goes out and does everything that they all did. That's, that's elevating yourself to a higher place than God wants you to do. I I'm going to tell you, if God used us like he used Jesus or Peter or Paul, we would really have to have some hell in our life to keep our feet on the ground and not become proud and arrogant because you don't understand if, if, if God's going to use you, he's got to have a weight on the other end of that use to keep you human and keep you understanding that you have clay feet that you cannot just go out and have God like use you like Moses or, or, or like Paul or Peter, you know, the Bible says of Peter, he did things, God did very um, unique miracles through the hands of Peter. Well, let me ask you, would you like that? Would you like to be used like Peter? Let me show you something about Peter you might not know. Peter, when he got through doing all those things, he was taken to jail. He was beaten for doing those things. 
and God had to break him out of jail a few times. And then at the end of his life, you know what they did to Peter? They put him in jail and they took his wife and they put her in jail. And you know what they did? They crucified his wife in front of him. And they had him stand there and say, now you can save her life if you will say that you've been lying about Jesus. And Peter had to look at his wife and say, stay strong, stay strong. I can't do that. You know I can't do that. And she's looking at him saying, I don't want you to do that. We know Jesus is real. We know our message is true. And Peter watched his wife crucified before his eyes. And then because he did not pass their test and, and flinch, they took him and they did him the same way. This is what it might mean to be used like Peter. Don't know if that's what we want. Not sure I, that's what I want. I think I just want to use the stories from Peter and let that go. You know, I don't want to go there unless that's what God has for me. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not God, so I don't get a choice on what God wants me to do. But I'm just saying, you know, when you hear people that are overly anxious for the miracle side and, they, and they're going to see all that stuff restored. Well, first of all, I've never seen it. I've never, you know, I was raised in an organization that preached this, but I never seen that. I've seen God do some things, but nothing like Peter, nothing like Jesus. And so um, I don't think that's exactly what we're going to see in America. But what we will see is that God will back up this, the word of God, and we can preach this, we can declare this, we can tell the stories of what God has done 2000 years ago. And, uh, and that should be sufficient. And I know that to be true, because Thomas, remember Thomas, and you guys, this is a super big point for me in disconnecting from some of the things in my past. G, uh, uh, Thomas says to the disciples who saw Jesus raised from the dead, they saw him after he was raised from the dead, and they witnessed it. They saw him. They hugged him. They touched him. And Thomas was not there. And so Thomas was told by these guys, uh, hey, uh, Jesus is alive. And Thomas said these words, I don't believe it. I won't believe it until I put my hands into the scars on his body, then I'll believe it. And so Jesus being the wonderful, loving savior that he is, made an opportunity to show up when Thomas was with the rest of the disciples and he shows up there and he says, Thomas, Thomas, come here. And Thomas is like, oh, I see a ghost. And so he walks over there, he goes, Thomas, feel my hands. A ghost does not have flesh and bone as you see that I have. Feel these scars, feel this side of mine, and believe. And Thomas knelt down in front of Jesus. And by the way, Jesus wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be accepting this worship if he would not have been God. But Thomas kneels before him and says, my Lord and my God. And then the key is the words that Jesus said after that. He said, Thomas. You believe because you saw, but blessed are those who, having not seen, still believe. That told me something right there that I was not taught in my theology training to be a part of my previous life in the organization I came from. And that is, is that God's will is that there would be all of us and all of us fit into this category who believe in that Jesus that we have not seen and we have not felt his nail scars in his hands, but we still believe. And basically there's a greater blessing for those who don't have to have physical evidence who can take the testimony of witnesses we can trust and all of the witnesses in the Bible, 12 disciples, 11 of those 12 died martyrs deaths saying that what they had been teaching and preaching was so true they would not they would not save their life to deny it what is that it sounds like it's really harsh from god to take the people closest and most blessed and put them in a situation where they were going to have to give their life in some gruesome deaths 
But when you think about it now, 2000 years from now, it assures my heart that this that I have staked my life on is believable because God loved me so much that he was willing to take them and give them that kind of death to reassure us and those who would hear us to reassure us that we are telling the truth, that we have witnesses that are beyond reproach. People that we can trust. Why? They gave up their life in a gruesome, either they lost their head or they were burned at the stake or they were hung on a cross. That's how they died. James in the Bible, uh, 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 one of the disciples, James, he was killed uh, in just uh, about seven years after Jesus' resurrection. Um, God allowed that. And yet with Peter, he let him live out his whole life. He busted him out of jail several times. And then on the end, he went to jail and that was going to be it. God had done everything through Peter that he wanted to do. He got his last two books written and boom, he let him become crucified. He let his wife become crucified. This stuff can make you go, "Ah, I don't want to have nothing to do with a God like that. Or you can appreciate what I'm saying tonight is I have this story to tell you so that you can realize these are not frivolous matters. That God, when he called Peter, he knew he was calling him to do something really crazy, really strange. And so he let him have the highs of casting out devils and doing miracles and wonders, uh, signs, all kinds of things. But then there's this counterweight of humanness that he had to go through too, which kept him from becoming a God in his own mind, which, you know, all too often, that's what happens to people that have great abilities. So this is really, really important. So the overall message being stressed in the gospel of John is that God, God actually became a man. God did, not someone else not an an emissary, not someone that wasn't God. It was God who became a man. The fourth gospel has no account of Jesus's baptism. It doesn't talk about his temptation in the desert with the devil. It doesn't talk about him casting out devils. His transfiguration is not mentioned, which is a big deal. Um, That was them seeing Christ in his kingdom glory which he predicted they would see before they died, and they did. He did not talk about many of these things, and these things are highlighted in all of the synoptic gospels. Synoptic meaning Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic meaning that they're following the same order and the same stories to greater or lesser degrees. To me, this suggests that John was well aware of how fully these were covered in the other gospels, and it also suggests that John was aware of these other gospels, And so according to the scholars, uh, they think that those other gospels were written before John wrote this one. Now, another outstanding thing in the uh, fourth gospel is the extensive teaching about the Holy Spirit, which stands in contrast to the scarceness of Jesus's teachings on this subject in the synoptic gospels. And it's hard to imagine how much he says in John and how little he gives to it in the other gospels. And so it kind of shows you that you could not have a full teaching uh, that comes from Christ unless you had both Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or at least Matthew or Luke and John. Now, I, I, I am particularly uh, interested more in Luke than John, I mean, than uh, Matthew and Mark. I need them all so don't misunderstand. But if I was going to pick one to read, Luke's the one I like. I like the, the things that he, the details that he brings out. But there, you're not going to get a full teaching of the Holy Spirit, which by the way, <clears throat> the reason for that is he's not talking about in Luke about the Holy Spirit operating in the church in the future. It's John that talks so much about that and what's going to happen in the future. Luke's going to focus more on what the Holy Spirit is doing in the present in the course of that narrative. And that's what makes it uh, so important. So again, to me, this indicates that John's desire not to duplicate the synoptic gospels was very clear to him. And so he wanted to strike a unique letter to to the church 
that would have in it the additional needed information and the tools to combat false doctrines of his day. Because you, you guys may not realize this, but even in the days of the apostles, immediately Satan brought up false teachings and false doctrines and false apostles and false teachers. And so right away they had to defend what they believed. Even though they were the eyewitnesses and they had the authority that they had, they still had to contend with these situations. So even though the things written in this gospel are to give birth to genuine faith, surprisingly, this may knock your socks off, faith is a noun. It doesn't even appear one time in the book of John. <laughs> That's crazy. But you know what does appear there? Believe. It is used 98 times. 98 times believe. I believe if I remember right, also in John, God calls, Jesus calls the Father, God the Father, using the term Father to point to him. I believe that was 90 times. So believe and Father become a very important factor in the Gospel of John. Generally, uh, when, you're, when you're running into believe in John, it's going to be believe in or believe upon or to believe into. And all of these are an act of the will. To believe in Jesus does not mean to nod affirmatively in agreement with John's statements about him. It is a belief that brings you face to face with the facts of the gospel. And if you realize the truth of it, it actively transforms your life, birthing you as a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now I want to talk to you about, before we go on, I want to I want to just give you a little shot in the arm about one of the divisions in the church today and it's been since about the 60s that this has happened. If you go back to Billy Graham, you guys aware of Billy Graham and his history? He was uh, a very probably the most popular and well-known Christian evangelist of our, of my life, but there was a big war in the middle of Billy Graham crusades and who was going to be the um, participants and the accepted uh, brothers in Christ to work together in city areas and do these crusades together because they would rent these huge stadiums and they would fill them up with people. And so at that time, they thought it was really a good idea to, to go ahead and unite with the Catholic Church and let them be a part of this too so they could participate with the Christian Protestants uh, in one form and at one place. This was hotly debated by people that said, oh, no, this doesn't work. We don't believe the same thing. And what happened then is that the church got into this huge struggle uh, where there was a big falling out between leaders because some leaders were saying, no, 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 if you confess Christ, you're my brother, and we don't ask no questions. We don't, we don't care if you're a Roman Catholic. We don't care if you are of liberal theology. And by the way, liberal theology is to take the Bible and take out all of the supernatural of the Bible, every bit of it, and tell uh, and make it not something that happened literally but that it is in the Bible as a story that teaches a more important lesson so the Bible does not need to be proven to be literally true. That's what it means. They decided that it's a great idea that we're going to get together and we're going to just make it this simple. If you love Jesus, you're in. And that may, to you and to me, on the surface, sound good. Okay, why why make divisions now? Let's just try to do, let's just try to get the gospel out there. Those of the opposite sides, Billy Graham, and the way that it actually ended up going was, no, 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 let's not make distinctions here. Let's go ahead and just unite around the one, the only Jesus Christ. And if you are pro-Jesus, and you've confessed him as your savior, then there you are. You are in, okay? Big problem, big problem. 
And that big problem is going to come up over and over again as we go into the book of John. And this week, I saw someone who I admire, who I mentioned from time to time, I uh, mentioned him last week, uh, getting up and saying something that I couldn't believe he said. And that is, uh, someone had a video clip of him in his, his older age, and that, um, trying to think of his name, McGee is his name. Yeah, J. Vernon McGee. Um, he's like, here's what he said, uh, yeah, paraphrase. Some people preach that the gospel is a lordship gospel. I'm going to tell you that's a heresy. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I've heard this guy teach the Bible so many times. And I've never heard him address this issue. But that's a big red flag for me. Big red flag. Why is it a big red flag? Here's why. Jesus said in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, unless a person is born of the water and of the spirit, he will not, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so what I've done is I've done a whole lot of um, study into this subject. There's a really good book out there called, and it's not a book that you guys might be interested in reading. It's more of a book a pastor or someone who has um, responsibility to this would read but it's called The Great Evangelicalism Divide. And what's crazy about this is I don't think, I don't think that the normal churchgoer in America has any idea that this, this war is actually going on. But what the war is is that between those who think, here's what they think, they think that if you accept Jesus, in other words, if you pray a prayer and you receive Jesus into your life, by so many words, that you have just entered into eternal life and it doesn't matter what you do after that. You have the option to make Jesus Lord and to disciple, be one of his disciples, or you have the option not. Because here's what they think. They think that the minute that you say, I looked at Jesus, I asked him to be my savior, you're saved, and nothing can ever change that. One book that I have says this. You can even become the Antichrist, and God cannot send you to hell because he signed on the dotted line, and when you accepted Jesus, you signed on the dotted line, and that's it. You're saved, always saved, never to be lost again, no matter what. And I'll tell you right now, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe taking a human and making them or coaxing them into saying, Jesus, come into my life, save me, and that seals the deal. I do not believe that it does. And I'll tell you why. Because there is a definite theology about what it means to be born again. And that theology is you have to go from there to what Nicodemus knew because Jesus chided him. Nicodemus, you don't know these things and you're the teacher of Israel. So you got to know that what he's telling Nicodemus is taught in the Old Testament, not the new. And the, in the organization I used to be in, they would go from that, John 3, 4, and 5. John chapter 3, verses 3, 4, and 5. They would take you straight to Acts 2.38. And they would never stop to think that, that, that that's future. That hasn't happened yet. So what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, he says, you don't know these things? So that he didn't have to wait to get to Acts 2.38. He needed to already know it. And the way you know it is you go back to Ezekiel chapter, I think it's 36. And in there it says, God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. I am going to take water and sprinkle it on you. There's the water. And I am going to take my word well, I'm going to take your old heart and take it out and put a new heart in you, a heart of flesh. In other words, a heart that can be trained and malleable and learn instead of the whole old calloused heart. And that is what it means to be born again. So if you do say, Jesus, I receive you into my life, and then that transformation happens, then you have been born again. 
But if that happens, Jesus clearly teaches through the gospel of John and through the, through the New Testament epistles, he clearly teaches that what is really going on is that he is looking for disciples. And in John, we're going to see this over and over. He's going to say things like, if you don't do this, you can't be my disciple. If you don't give up everything you have, you can't be my disciple. If you don't hate your father and mother and sister and brother. In other words, if, if there comes a tug of war between you and God and someone in your family, you got to act as if, if I got to choose to hate one, it's going to be them and not God. And that's what Jesus is saying. You got to make your choice to go into these things. So this is why it is really hard to find a real good church. When I came here to town, I didn't know I was going to do this. And so we went to several churches. I'm going to tell you, I pity people who try to find a good church that believes things the way that scripture is stated, you know, because it's not, it's not every church that does this. But what is so crazy is this idea that you can be saved, but you don't have to make Jesus Lord. If I believed that, then I would be with the Billy Graham crusade and I would unite with the Catholics. But since I don't believe that, I would have been on the other side of that issue. And I am on the other side of that issue. And I don't believe that just because someone says, Lord, Lord, makes them a Christian. And that's what Jesus says in John. We'll run into this eventually. Uh, Lord, Lord, no. Uh, this is this is not what makes you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is the fact that something crazy has happened inside your heart. All of a sudden, you have interest in this that you didn't have interest in before. All of a sudden, this makes sense when it didn't used to make sense. All of a sudden, you're praying, God, make me understand this when before is like, good, I don't understand it, so I don't need to read it. Big difference. It's so crazy. I talked to a guy today, uh, this week, that I work with and I was working with him on a thing and his name was Christian. And, and I said, eh, are you a Christian? He's like, Oh no, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm agnostic. I said, Oh wow. I said that, that must be quite a, quite a contradiction to have the name Christian and being an agnostic. He goes, yeah, yeah, it is. A lot of things in my life are contradictions. And I said, well, you know, why are you named Christian? He goes, oh, I'm, my mom's a Catholic and she raised me as a Catholic and I went to Catholic church. I went to Catholic school and I come out an agnostic. And I thought, yeah, I've heard that story a lot of times from the Catholic church. And that's because the Catholic church don't believe this born again business at all. They believe the other side. They believe if they baptize you as a baby, that's what makes you a Christian. They got the water <laughs> and the spirit happening when you have an infant that's a few days old and you go to Catholic church and they sprinkle the water on them and they declare the Holy Spirit's in them. All of that stuff sounds good. It doesn't actually happen. It's not real. Same thing in the Catholic church is not real. When you take communion, they said, Oh, it turns into the body of Christ and the, the, the juice, the blood, the wine that turns into the blood of Christ. And they teach that as being, that's what actually happens when you come to communion. Is that what happens when it comes to, com to, to communion? No, it's not at all what happens. What that is, is a representation for the blood and a representation for the flesh that only looks back, points, it's like a big sign with a pointer. I'm saved because of Christ on the, on the cross. I'm saved because of the blood he shed on the cross and then he was resurrected. That is what that means. So I hope that as I delve into these kind of details with you, that you will see that value. This is the wrapping paper. This is the beautiful gift. This is God going to great care to make sure you're not religious, that you have true religion. The Bible teaches in, in the New Testament epistles, it tells us that if, if somebody has denied the faith, their religion is in vain. The Bible says in James, I heard it today in my Bible reading today, James said, if a person does not control their tongue, their religion is worthless. You see? And so the people that say, oh, you just say Jesus' name, save me. It doesn't matter if you're a disciple. It doesn't matter if you do anything right. It doesn't matter if you follow Jesus. Now, listen. 
if you were saved when you said that, your whole what matters changes. And maybe a minute before, you would not care about these things. But the minute that you receive, actually receive Christ because he's inviting you in, that is when you have that glowing experience that everyone's is different, but they know that they are new inside. They know their sins have come off of them. They are no longer held under their past. They have a future where they will never be held by their their mistakes in the future because they don't want to live that way anymore. That's called discipleship. That's called really getting to know the Lord. I want to go through the at least the divisions of John's gospel so that you'll see where we're headed, okay? In the opening of John's gospel, we have the prologue, which is a fancy word for the preface or the opening statements. And this is covered from the first verse to the 18th verse. And that's the ones we're going to be focused on starting next time uh, that we address this. Next week is right before Easter. We may do something different next week around Easter. And, and I even like the word Easter, but Resurrection Sunday, we may do something like that more traditionally, but I'll give you some insights to, to what, I, what I want you to understand about the Resurrection Sunday, which is Easter is, is a bad word because it's not a Christian word. It, it came from uh, paganism. And so um, <clears throat> I just try to avoid Easter as much as I can for a word, uh, but not because it's a big deal, but just because I know the difference. And then, and then that's, I'll tell you about that then. In this section, these first 18 verses, uh, what John is going to be doing is describe the pre existent word. The logos uh, is the big word who will break down in a lot of ways. Who was with God in the beginning and was the agent of creation and was the incarnate in the person of Christ. So by starting the gospel like this, John is going through and making sure that the main character's identity is very clear. And so that is what's going to be happening there. And then in the next section, the most important section is the uh, introduction, which covers the remaining verses in chapter 1, verses 19 through 51. And here we're going to go through the all-important testimony of John the Baptist. Think about it. John the Baptist was a prophet who gave his life for the testimony of Jesus. So the bulk of John is the testimony of Jesus' works and words and his miracles and signs. This is what's going to be the bulk of the book of John. And that's going to be chapters 2 through 12. And finally, when we get toward the end of John, it is the crucifixion comes close. And we have the final days of Jesus' life, the last week. And he prepares his disciples for what they don't know is coming, which is the church age. They think the kingdom's coming. And what's coming is a spiritual kingdom called the church age. And so uh, that is is going to be a time where they're going to have to learn to deal without him physically there. And so that's why this is where he gets into the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit that's coming at that time. The church age wasn't known to them, even in Jesus, to Jesus' closest disciples. It would not be fully understood until after his resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So Jesus' visible testimony to the whole world is his very public crucifixion. They sentenced him to death as if he were a common criminal and a murderer, even though he was a perfect man without sin. So John covers this, the death, burial, and resurrection in chapters 18, 19, and 20. And then the very last chapter is the epilogue, which is the conclusion. And in that chapter, we find the glorified Christ, the resurrected Christ, giving last minute explanations to the disciples. He especially talks to Peter there, restores Peter from his waywardness and his uh, complete denial of him. And he forgives him and he appoints him as the spokesman who's going to have the keys of the kingdom to the Jews. And so this is where we're going to be when we start this again. And then we're going to go verse by verse and we're going to look at these details together. Let's stand. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for the details that you've given us tonight. Lord, we pray that we 
personally will make sure that we are born again, that we've had that internal surgery where there's a new heart, a new faith, a new desire for you. And if that happened, then we are secure in our salvation. We are secure. Nobody can take us away from you. We cannot accidentally lose our salvation. We cannot even fail and then lose our salvation unless failure becomes our idol and we decide we don't want you anymore. The only way you can lose God is to give him up, to reject him, to deny him. As the Bible says in Paul's teachings, if somebody doesn't take care for, of their own family, then they have denied the faith, which means Paul believed in the ability to deny the faith. That's the only thing that can wreck us. Nothing else can. Satan can't. Demons can't. Doctrines of demons can't as long as we stay true to you and we keep ourselves in the faith. Continue. It's a continual thing. Lord, let it be true for all of us to be that and to teach this to our children. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us on our Fathom Ministries podcast. If this ministry has been beneficial to you and your walk with the Lord, please consider a monthly donation to our ministry effort by clicking on the donate button in the description of this video or podcast. To find out more about Fathom Ministries Church, please join us at fathomministrieschurch.com. Thank you for listening and supporting this ministry.